Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 15 of the Short Explanations Podcast. My name is Hayam. Tom is there. And huh? there, I mean on YouTube. So if you didn't know, we we actually do this on Discord. Uh, so we see each other on Discord. And it's good to see each other so we know when the other person's talking, all that other good stuff. But then we we simulcast to Twitch so everyone can see it who they wanted to. Again, we're trying to work the YouTube algorithm and everything else and trying to get it. We're figuring maybe if we go live on YouTube, that would help us and whatever, trying to get more subscribers, all that other good stuff. So we are testing this out. Feel free to jump in there. Again, subscribe. Otherwise, we have a show today. This is probably part one of a multiple part series that Tom, this is all Tom. Tom's going to discuss TOTP, time, O, time, protocol. I forgot the O. Uh, you know what? Every time I have to talk about TOTP, I have to look it up. There's there's my there's my YouTube confession. Uh, time based one time password. So it's the okay. TOTP. So th those are I do know this. Those are the six digit codes, at least part of it, that you get when they want you to uh, confirm a second factor. So there we go. There's the extent of my knowledge on this. So go for it. Okay, so TOTP, and I'm actually going to turn off push to talk here. So uh, TOTP is a time-based one-time password um, as opposed to HOTP, which is an HMAC-based uh, one-time password. Uh, basically, the, the simplest, shortest, easiest explanation is TOTPs are for time. So you take a wall clock, and then you do some math on it, and you get a, a code. Uh, an HMAC is like a counter. Right? So you've got a thing that constantly increments, and each subsequent increment, uh, incrementation of the number will give you a new code. Uh, that doesn't mean like your code is going to be like a five zeros one, five zeros two. It just means that the thing that actually goes into the algorithm to generate your random six-digit code is based on a counter instead of a wall clock. Um, probably way more information than you wanted or needed to know, but we're going to make it even worse because I'm going to tell you how TOTP works under the hood, but not like crazy propeller hat. Here is like all the algorithms and math that goes into this thing. And how exactly do you make a pseudo random number generator using computer science terminology? We're just going to keep it super high level. Um, and that's for two reasons. One is because it's easier to explain to people how these things work and giving you a good idea of like the tech that goes into it. And two, uh, that says more personal, there's less of a chance of me getting all the fine details wrong because, you know, I, I cannot be uh, considered like a cryptography expert. Please don't ask me to write your algorithms. I won't. And if I do, I'll be bad. Uh, so, TOTP. Um, you get a six-digit code, you put it in on a website, and then you log in, and it's magic. Explanation over. There we go. We're done here. Thanks for coming. But you got to get that six-digit code. <laughs> so uh, how these things work, uh, if you've ever set up TOTP or two-factor authentication on your device using those six-digit codes, you'll know that you've got to scan a QR code or copy some, like, like random characters into another program and then you get six digits out of it. How, how does that work? Um, so where this starts is with random number generators or a specific kind of random uh, number generator, a PRNG, a pseudo random number generator. Um, it's pseudo because it's not really truly random. It's, it's kind of as close as we can get to random uh, with hard things like computers. But it's never truly completely random unless you've got a random number generator that's just pulling uh, random background radiation, you know, uh, that exists throughout the universe. Unfortunately, though, if you're just using that straight up, um, depending on a lot of factors, it might not be as secure or safe or secret as you want it to be. So um, I tell so. my students this, if you can create a purely random number generator, please contact the government. They will pay you lots <laughs> and lots of money. Um, yes. The lava lamps at the Cloudflare Studios have already been taken, so you can't use lava lamps. 
or the patent on uh, the camera facing an organized group of lava lands to extract uh, random extreme randomness. So you'll have to do something else. But if you can do that, you have you will be set for life. So with a PRNG, there's actually even subsets of these random number generators. And what we want is we want predictable randomness, which sounds kind of weird, right? If you want randomness, why do you want it to be predictable? Aren't those two things in conflict with each other? And the answer is, yeah, kind of. Um, so what you want is something that's predictable because you want to you know, make an authentication system, you need the same output for the same input, right? You can't just throw up a username and password field and be like, I don't know, what do, what do you feel like your password is today? Yeah, that, that seems like a you password. You're good, buddy. We'll log you in, right? That doesn't make any sense. So you have to pre-provide your password uh, so there's a known value to compare against. Um, a a seeded pseudo random number generator works kind of the same way, right? You you have to put in an input and expect a consistent output, and that has to be the same every single time it works. Um, as long as the inputs are the same, the outputs have to be the same. Uh, so what you're doing with that that big long code that you would type in uh, or copy paste somewhere else or that QR code is that's part of the seed that goes into this random number generator. Um, so you're going to have a lot of different pieces in play. And that's why we're going to keep it really high level and then dive in a little further. Uh, so you've got that code, that identifier, or the yeah, identifier code, basically, that goes into the seeded random number generator. But you also have time itself. Uh, and this is quite literally just the clock that's on your computer or phone or wherever. It doesn't have to be online, it doesn't have to have a web service, as long as the time is roughly uh, synchronized uh, with other computers in the world, you'll get the same codes. Uh, and there's usually some flex space there. So TOTP actually allows you a whole bunch of different options. If you want to generate 15 digit codes every seven seconds and have that that seed uh, value uh, or the, the secret value uh, be like a million characters long, you can totally do that. And it will give you what you ask for. But the typical configuration is 30 second windows. Um, and, you know, the, the key can vary, but it's typically somewhere between eight and 64 characters from what I've seen. Um, and then the codes it generates are six digits. Um, so what that time block means is that in 30 seconds, in any 30 second interval, that is going to give you the same code, right? And that's why you have that clock that constantly counts down and every 30 seconds, you get a brand new code. Uh, and that's because the particular algorithm and settings that most people pick for TOTP are the standard six digits and 30 second time blocks. As long as your computer is synchronized within 30 seconds as the server you're connecting to or trying to authenticate to, you're fine. Your codes are going to match up. And how this works is that the TOTP algorithm um, takes in that initial key. It takes in your time block, so your, your 30 seconds of time. Like, okay, right now it's, uh, it, it's 4.49 p.m. and some amount of seconds. Let's say it's after that 30 seconds. Let's say it's like 35 seconds. So, okay, we've got... We've got some time here, we've got a key, um, and we're going to run that through a hash function to get some stuff out on the other end. Now, the other end is not going to be a code. Uh, instead, we have to do more cryptographic nonsense and more hashing to actually turn that into a six-digit code. So we basically give this thing um, an alphabet to use and say, okay, you can use these characters to represent this data at the end of the, the hash function. Uh, and the character set we give it is just zero through nine, right? Uh, we'd say six digits of zero through nine and have it build the thing for you. Uh, and then at the end, you get a code. Now, what makes this pretty just awesome uh, compared to things like always online two-factor authentication systems is you never actually have to be online. As long as you have the same seed values as the other side, and this is why when you're signing up for two-factor authentication or enabling it on an account, 
the server itself is going to generate that key and hand it to you, usually in the form of a QR code, right? You've got the same information that the server does, and you would have the same period in time that the server does. Uh, so since you're using TOTP and you've got the same keys in the same time, the inputs are the same, so the codes are going to be the same. So the server knows, yeah, your two-factor authentication code should be one, two, three, four, five, six. And I know it's got to be one, two, three, four, five, six, because I did the math myself, and this is what it turned out. When you do that math on your phone and you go to Authy or Google Authenticator or Bitwarden or what have you, you can look that up and be like, oh, hey, here's the code. You hand it to the server who looks at their math and goes, yeah, these are the same. It checks out and it lets you in. So that's why TOTP can work without network connections. It can work without the two sides knowing about each other. Uh, and it's going to be consistent throughout time. So let me ask you this. Um, so the server, so the server, you, whatever that code generation is, gets stored there in like, the, like some parallel database. So if somebody steals it, hopefully it's on a different database and you have that and it's just counting 30 seconds based on the server clock and your clock. So like you said, if you're offline, like it can be a couple off, but there has to be some sort of range. Like, I don't know if your phone clock was off, is that a problem? So um, if your phone clock is off in... 30 second increments, it can be a problem. Here's where the implementation gets a little bit fuzzy. Uh, because you don't, like, typically for user experience reasons, you don't want to be, like, hard and fast with a lot of these rules. Like, I mean, obviously with passwords, you have to be hard and fast, right? It either matches or it doesn't. And the code, it either matches or it doesn't. With one exception that's pretty commonly deployed, which is... We're going to do the math for this 30 second increment that we're in right now, but we're also going to do one for the time before and the time after. So 30 seconds before, we'll run that math again and get a different six digits, and then we'll move forward by a minute, you know, the, the forward 30 seconds, just in case you're skewed in that direction, and we're going to get that code. We're actually going to accept three different TOTP codes, one for right now, one for 30 seconds before now, and one for 30 seconds after now. And that way, even if your phone is off by, you know, 25 seconds or 45 seconds in either direction, you're still going to end up with a valid code at the end. Now, does this decrease security? Yes, absolutely. You are, you are asking for one particular value and you will accept one of three particular values in this scenario. But is it like horrifyingly more insecure? No. Absolutely not. And what it means is that you don't really have to worry too, too hard about uh, your end user's computer clock being in perfect synchronization, right? Uh, when we're doing a modulus on the time, we don't care if you're at, you know, a minute 30, a minute 35, a minute 45, a minute 57. You're still within that second half of that minute, that 30 second block right there. So when we run the math, we're just going to take the 30 or zero, zero on the minute and run the math. We're not going to do those exact seconds. If you did exact seconds, every 60 seconds, or uh, every one second, sorry, you would get a new code, right? Because you're taking that time exactly instead of in those 30 second buckets. Um, so for user experience reasons, and because computers are hard and stuff gets out of sync and uh, things stop updating their clock, like there's a lot of reasons why that would have issues being exactly as precise as you want it usually accept a code before or even a code after um, just to let the user log in. Because, you know, the difference between one out of a million different values, a little less than a, a million different values, uh, versus, um, you know, three out of a million values is pretty negligible. It's, it's within air bands. You're fine. Uh, it's okay to decrease security just by a smidge there. Uh, to make the experience of using two-factor authentication better. Uh, the, the flip side of this is that, like, if you were too hardcore and you said, okay, you, you have to put in the code and type it in within three seconds or else it'll change, and we're not accepting any flex there, uh, people just would turn off two-factor authentication. Uh, this kind of security, like, end-user-based computer science security is just as much an effort in trying to make the technology safe as it is trying to make the technology 
accessible and acceptable. Right, because if if nobody is going to use it, if you had to like do like an a retina scan and put your thumbprint like into a computer just to connect to HTTPS, no one would use HTTPS. No one would even suggest that because it's just such a bear to use. Uh, so decreasing the security of TOTP a little bit to offer that little wiggle room for people is the right call. So what I heard today, just now in the last 10 minutes, is that when your security code is at three and then two and then one, it's okay to put it in. Cause like, I'm looking at like, like I'm on my phone, it's like 10 seconds left. I'm like, I'm not gonna be able to switch fast enough to get that code in within the 30 seconds. And then I'm gonna screw myself over and this and that and the other thing. Now I learned it's okay, it's okay. For most implementations, this is an implementation detail. So not every service is going to work this way. I have built TOTP login services to do two-factor authentication. And in my naivete, I said, here's 30 seconds. We're accepting the one code and that's it. So if you were logging into the, the bad sites that I have built in the past, yet yeah, you'd be out of luck if you're trying to type in a code with two seconds. But in some other sites that are good at user experience stuff, yeah, you've got some wiggle room there and you can just go ahead and type in that code. It doesn't matter if it's a little bit off because you're going to have the wiggle room. So that's good to know. I'm happy about that. Good. What's next? I, that's, that's really about it. Um, when okay. I originally sketched out uh, this episode and this explanation, I was going to go into exactly how PRNGs work and how do you see the PRNG and what does that even mean to see the PRNG and how does the math work out? But as I kept writing it, I realized, oh my God, I'm building a, a high school level cryptography course out of this. And no, you don't want that. A, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's not going to come over well in audio and B, no one wants it. <laughs> so, well, so let's ask this. Uh, this was the how quick does... and dirty TOTP. That's it. I mean, I have a feeling in my random guess is that the text message codes work almost are basically this. They're the whoever's sending SM not the not the SMS specifically SMS either email or SMS. They're creating that 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 uh, the the QR code essentially. They're sending you the code to put in, and they're giving a time to live of like ten minutes. Yep. And so, so they're not first, giving you the QR code. They're just saying, here, we're just going to give you the number and and you're going to put it in. You have X amount of minutes. And the reason we say in, it's insecure is because SMS is insecure. Not that that code is insecure. Same with email. If somebody has access to your email, they have it. And you're, you're, you're beholden to the server to give you another code rather than having the QR code on your phone. Exactly. And now these systems, like it, it looks because it's still a six digit code, right? It could be TOTP on the back end and they might just be running that math and then sending it to you. Or the easier way to build a system like that is you just generate a random six digit number. You throw it in your database and you give it that 10 minute time to live value and you say, OK, we'll send them this one. Uh, and it's it's way simpler to code that there's less cryptography involved in. I, it's it's kind of harder to mess up because the only thing you're doing is writing a number to a database. And then when somebody logs in, you just check and you go, yeah, that's the one. And that's it. So you don't need to do any kind of crazy cryptography. TOTP is better in just about every way there is to be better. Uh, but for an SMS fallback, uh, yeah, they're really just creating the code on their side and holding it. Uh, now, what you said about separate databases, most places that have a user's table are just going to store the TOTP key back in that user's table. They, there's typically not any separation there, uh, at least in the products that I've worked on and I've seen. Because right, I guess the password is hashed, so, I mean... Right, so the password yeah. is hashed. The OTP key, though, has to be in plain text, right? because you have to generate that. You can't use a hash of a secret that you have to put into a, a random number generator to get output, right? Predictable input, predictable output. So you have to have that as plain text. Those six digit uh, codes, you could possibly like do a thing where you generate the code and then email it to someone and then hash it and then store the hash in your database and then they input the code and then you hash it again and compare the hashes, but 
you're still generating the key, so I think that would be a negligible security improvement at best. So I'm if somebody steals that database, they have so they have the user, they have the hash, and then and they, they have, have that code. Keys. So now they just have to brute force the hash. Yeah, because they have the key. They also yep. need yeah, they need your password. They have so the key, and they they would... have the time, right? Unless yeah. they're a time traveler out of time. Uh, but yes, oh. yes, that means they have that the six-digit if... code. They have the six-digit yeah. code, and they have your username. Now they need the password. But if they've yeah. broken in to get the database, they probably don't need to get into your account because right. they have the company. Correct. Um, so... uh, but yeah, you're right. So if if somebody's authentication database got got yoinked, you know, there's a chance that you might not have to change your password. You probably should, but you don't necessarily have to if they're using a a really awesome state of the art. Uh, password hashing algorithm. But it does mean that, yes, everyone who had two-factor, congratulations, you're all getting brand new QR codes. So Look under well, no, your chair. Uh, There's a new two-factor yeah. QR code. I mean, I guess I don't remember this with these websites that I have, and I say, oh, I'm safe because of that. I mean, at that point, they should, they should um, revoke both the password and the QR code. They I don't should. remember that, but... Now again, the, I don't have that many. The, with it. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, luckily, I, I don't. Can I say that sealing password databases isn't an everyday occurrence? It might be an everyday occurrence now. Uh, these things keep happening, uh, and and they've stopped being news for the most part. Uh, but yeah, it it does mean that when a website says, "Oh no, we had a breach," you have to change your password. If they don't have you change your your two factor authentication seed two, they really should. And if there's one off the top of your head that you can remember, hey, I've got two factor there and I had to change my password from a breach. The best way, and I, I wish, I wish that the, the UI around two factor authentication was better than it was. Because honestly, most of the time to get a new two factor secret, you have to disable two factor authentication for your account and then re-enable it. And uh, yeah, it's it's just like, a, maybe a couple minutes for you to do that switch, but it's still a couple of minutes that you know, your account is not protected by two factor. And that just doesn't sit well with me. I have seen like very few sites, but they will offer like a regenerate option and have you put in like your old codes and new codes side by side, and then they'll do the switch, um, which is pretty cool. That's a, that's a slick way to do it. It's I just remember, I can't, I cannot remember a site that lost both. Like I like a site that lost password data, like where we had to redo the password that had a two factor code. Um, usually it's me saying, I want to change my password and doing, doing something else. So uh, to collect the two factor codes, I do it. I think which everyone does is I, I print them out. So, so, okay. So we have to store these in some device. So to have that secret QR code, once you put the code in, it goes away. Like you can never get it again for the most part. So what I do is I take a screenshot, I print it out, put it in, put it someplace. So in case I get a new device, I can just scan them. Um, so, but I, and then like you said, to change it, I have to go and disable and then re-enable and then say, uh oh, which one is this and everything else. If I wish there was another way to do some sort of linking or whatever it is, but. I'm hoping that the whole yeah. thing just goes away. Like I'm hoping literally the whole idea goes away and there's a pass keys or something else that comes out that replaces it. Like, okay, it's fine for right now. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, as soon as pass keys get a better story around uh, mobile authentication, I think you'll, you'll start to see, like once somebody does it really well, I know there are solutions out there, but they all feel kind of janky in their own way. Um, uh, once somebody comes out with a really slick way of using pass keys on mobile devices, I think you'll start to see more people using them. Uh, now, that said, it's still kind of annoying because, like, you know, I'm sitting here at my, my desk and my, my keys are upstairs in the bedroom and, like, I have to go walk up there when I'm logging into something. Um, again, not in, maybe in my case, not an everyday occurrence, but it, it has... Uh, it made me go to, well, that's fine. I'll click the use another way and use my backup TOTP uh, authy system, right? Because it's kind of annoying. And that's what you have to fight against when you're building security products, right? You want to keep people safe, but if you make it too annoying to use, they're going to pick the less secure option. 
even me. And again, then, and for most of us, we also have SMS as a backup, which again is the lowest hanging fruit to make all of this just not worth it. Anyway, um, I think that's it, right? Yep. We're a little short, yes. but we don't have to hit a time period. So I think that's great. If, we'll use this if you have uh, questions or if I've gotten something wrong or if I've glossed over like a, a critical key detail, please uh, let me know and, and we will absolutely put like corrections, updates, etc. in future episodes. Uh, you can let us know in the Signal group, uh, which has just a bunch of awesome people and scary pictures of what look like the end of the world because i understand there are some fires over in your neck of the woods new york city looks like i related to if you've played breath of the wild the blood moon rising but it is it's very post apocalyptic right now and it's very unsafe outside everything else so we're all inside but with that said yes join our signal group obviously uh do all the other good things and i think that's it we're not recording next week so next week we get the week off so we're giving you that now we're not we're gonna be the week after so with that said i we're gonna end it and we will see everyone in two weeks hopefully have a good night everybody see everyone